make a start. Uh, so, my name's Hugh, and I live and work on Derrick Social Croft in the Western Highlands of Scotland. And forest bathing is something that I've been really quite interested in and quite passionate about learning more about over the last two to three years, especially since moving to Scotland and living close to an ancient oak wood. So this workshop is really intended as an introduction to forest bathing. It's uh, a taster which will hopefully inspire you to try some of it for yourself, maybe incorporate a little bit into your daily life. Uh, the idea is really just to start small and give it a try. Uh, so there's no right way and wrong way. Give things a try. If you find them helpful, use them. Uh, if you don't find them helpful, uh, don't use them. So I'll give you a bit of background to uh, the workshop, really. In April 2020, uh, we should have been opening our croft up as a social croft, a bit like a care farm. Uh, blending uh, care farming approaches, nature-based craft activities, and ecotherapies such as forest bathing. Uh, but unfortunately, this all got a bit delayed by COVID-19. We've had grant funding uh, to deliver this, as I mentioned. So in part, it's an award from Think Health, Think Nature, which is the work programme of the Highland Green Health Partnership. And it aims to encourage greater use of the outdoors and to help tackle physical inactivity, mental health issues and health inequalities. And as part of this, I was co-delivering a range of uh, nature walks with a local High Life Highland countryside ranger. And these were aimed at getting people into nature and appreciating what's on their doorstep. And my intention had been to incorporate some forest bathing and nature-based mindfulness activities into these walks. However, as we're currently not able to run them, I'm running these online workshops instead, really to enable you to have a go for yourself. I'll state from the, the outset, I'm not currently uh, a certified forest bathing guide, nor am I a forest bathing therapist, uh, but I've been accepted onto the Forest Therapy Institute's training programme in September. So I'm hoping to become a certified guide uh, in a, in, over the next six months, really. At the end of the workshop, I will provide some details of how you can find a certified forest bathing guide near you or your nearest guide. However, much like a lot of other activities such as yoga or meditation, I really don't believe that having a guide is essential. You can get many of the benefits by trying it for yourself, but you might get more out of it if you did have a guide. So that's my, that's my take on it, really. I'll start by talking a little bit about uh, Shinrin Yoku and forest bathing and the origins of them. So the terms forest bathing, forest therapy and Shinrin Yoku uh, are all used fairly interchangeably. The word Shinrin Yoku was first used by uh, Tomohide Akiyama, who was the director of the Japanese Forestry Agency back in about 1982. And it translates from Japanese into forest, which is Shinrin, and bathing, which is Yoku. Uh, and interestingly, the characters even look a little bit like trees. So all these practices are uh, about walking slowly and leisurely through woods or forests generally, inhaling the forest air, immersing yourself in the natural environment and mindfully using all your senses. So it's about opening them to the forest atmosphere and fostering an emotional connection to the landscape and to the environment. And the idea behind it is really just to help you relax much more than it is to designed to raise your heart rate. So whilst uh, a usual forest bathing uh, activity uh, or outing might last two to three hours, it's not unusual to only cover a quarter of a mile or half a mile in this time. 
And usually people will engage in forest bathing activities maybe once a week or a few times a month. Again, it's a little bit like yoga. Practice builds the benefits uh, and the more regularly you do it, the more benefits you tend to find. That said though, you don't really need to go out and to explicitly practice forest bathing or, or shinrin yoku. You can really incorporate it into just a leisurely walk, which was fairly much the way that, that I used to deliver it on, on these uh, nature walks for, for well-being that we went on. Uh, so some of the cult cultures have, have slightly similar takes on the benefits of being in, in nature. The Scandinavian equivalent of Shinrin Yoku is called Freeluftsliv and translates into English as, as free air life or open air living. And it's a term first coined by the poet Henrik Ibsen, who used the term to describe physical, psychological and spiritual benefits that you get from spending time outside and the Scandinavian countries usually appear in the top rankings in the world happiness reports and it's often thought that an appreciation of, of nature is seen as, as a contributing factor in this. Uh, so we'll get really straight into uh, having a, a, an overview, looking at an overview of forest bathing. So forest bathing can really be done in any natural environment. Uh, you don't necessarily need a, a wood or a forest, but it's often best done in a, in a wooded setting. Ideally, uh, there's a, a path that you can uh, follow uh, that's easily accessible, fairly easy to use. Uh, ideally the environment should have some streams, some meadows, some open areas, more densely wooded areas uh, and ideally minimal intrusion from the modern world. Uh, it's best to, to uh, take a forest bath, as it were, uh, without any technological interference. The concept uh, doesn't really, unless it's raining, doesn't really involve getting wet at all. It's about bathing in the, the, the atmosphere in the forest. Uh, so it's usually suggested that you leave technology at home, leave your mobile phone at home, uh, and, and just have the minimum of distractions. So Facebook, so forest bathing can be done in groups or individually. Uh, it can be led or not. Uh, during the session, participants identify things in nature that uh, attract them. And these are called invitations. Uh, and they will then spend between about five minutes and 20 minutes contemplating how this part of nature relates to them and what they can learn from it. And if people are uh, experiencing this activity in a group, then periodically everyone may share what they've learned or, or share the things that they have uh, ob observed. If you're forest bathing by yourself, uh, you might wish to take a journal or uh, some other way of recording your thoughts. But I'll just go through some very general conventions that are usually followed when people are forest bathing. So the idea is that you allow yourself to be guided by invitations instead of being guided by accomplishing exercises or achieving things. So it's not like uh, Munro bagging in the Scottish Highlands or uh, trying to, to climb all the three peaks. Uh, it, it's, it's about communing with, with nature and, and uh, you know, linking with nature. We're going to have a look at a range of forest bathing in, interventions and invitations, uh, but spontaneity really is the key here. So you don't go on a forest bathing walk to get exercise or necessarily to reach a destination. So it, it's not like trying to reach a mountain top or uh, reach a lake or, or to reach a, a particular feature. The idea is that you slow down your mind, you breathe deeply, smell the rain, smell the pine resin, listen to the water flowing, uh, and you feel the breeze on your cheeks. The only destination or the only aim really is to achieve a state of being mindful, of absorbing the forest's energies by actively noticing sounds and smells and textures. 
Uh, so it, it's not about viewing the forest uh, as a place in which you necessarily do an activity more. It's about working with it as a, as a partner. We're going to look a little later at the importance of the concept of reciprocity in forest bathing. Uh, but the idea is that you try and minimise your efforts really to, to achieve anything specific. It's just about being so you don't try and force interactions equally you avoid trying to block out your surroundings and meditate it's just trying to experience the forest offerings as they come to you uh, and being open really to, to noticing things that you might not necessarily notice so forest bathing is a tool for slowing down our, our minds uh, and it's a way of practicing a, a secret superpower that we all have, which is the skill of consciously choosing what we focus our attention on. So, as I said earlier, forest bathing outings can often last anywhere from about two to four hours. During this time, the body and mind uh, will slow down and relaxation can be achieved. So the main purpose of forest bathing is to have downtime with a meditative feel. It's not about working out. Uh, and it's generally suggested that if you do find that you're uh, working out or exerting yourself that you, you stop for a few moments before restarting again slowly because it, it's the, the, the aim really is, is much more to lower your heart rate than to, to raise it. And as I said earlier, uh, the walks can often span quarter of a mile to, to half a mile. So it's not about covering a, a lot of distance. The suggestion if you're in groups is that conversations should be uh, minimal. However, when they're used, they should be positive and supportive. Each person in a group uh, will experience things slightly differently. There's no uh, need or emphasis on experiencing the forest as other people have or others are experiencing it. It's just about becoming one with the forest and listening to it kind of as it speaks to you and, and communicates with you. Uh, so it's just about enjoying your own experience as it, it happens. Uh, and ideally, each forest bathing experience should be unique. It should have its own highlights and features. Uh, and generally, the advice is to avoid trying to recreate previous positive experiences. Just open yourself up to the, the forest and believe that it will work with you positively and try and end all forest bathing experiences with a snack and a cup of tea. Uh, as I say if anyone does have any questions that they want to ask please feel free to write them in the chat box and I will uh, address them as they come up. There's a very distinct difference really between being mindfully in nature and practicing mindfulness and it's probably important to, to highlight the differences. So mindfulness uh, in its purest form really is the uh, basic human ability to be fully present, aware of where we are and what we're doing and not really overly reactive or overwhelmed by what's going on around us. So mindfulness is, is, is quite often sort of about uh, looking inwards. So the difference between mindfulness and forest bathing is that mindfulness in its truest sense is more about removing oneself from emotion and reaction to, to your surroundings. Whereas in forest bathing, there's a celebration of the experience of awe and wonder of time spent in, spent in nature. So, so you're, you're focusing much more on what goes, goes, goes on around you in forest bathing than, than you would if you were uh, practicing mindfulness. However, uh, anyone really can do either. Everyone can benefit from either uh, and they're both easy to learn. Both bring awareness and uh, a caring attitude into the things that we do. Uh, both of them are good ways to counter stress and anxiety uh, and even a little bit of either uh, tends to make our lives better. So somebody's asked if there's any paperwork to accompany uh, the workshop. I will send out some links to uh, some, some useful sources of further information about uh, forest bathing 
and we're going to talk about uh, invitations in a moment and I'll send you some links to uh, some information about forest bathing invitations as well. Uh, so there's lots of research into forest bathing which suggests that there are many physical health benefits. Uh, forest bathing reduces cortisol levels and cortisol is the hormone released when we experience stress. It lowers our pulse rate, it lowers blood pressure and it enhance, enhances our immune system. And also it's, it's been shown to have a, a very positive effect on sleep. In a study with people experiencing insomnia and poor sleep, forest bathing was used to induce relaxation and over a three month period, participants saw a marked improvement in their sleep cycles. Uh, which uh, in part, uh, they, they, I think because they also report much lower levels of anxiety. Uh, and this leads us quite nicely into the psychological benefits of forest bathing. And these are quite possibly the, 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 the greater of the two benefits are the psychological health benefits. So forest bathing has been shown to reduce stress, to reduce anxiety and depression. Uh, what's often found is negative emotions such as sadness and anger are reduced after time spent in natural environments. Self-esteem and mood has been shown to improve after just five minutes in a green natural space. Uh, one of the important things is, is forest bathers tend to experience less rumination. Uh, so becoming fixated on particularly negative thoughts or negative aspects of your, your life, which tends to be a marker of uh, mental ill health. Uh, some studies have shown that nature therapies such as forest bathing uh, can be more effective in relieving the symptoms of depression than talking therapies in certain people. Uh, although the likelihood is that this may be just people who are more sorts, uh, suited to it uh, as an approach. Uh, equally, attention uh, and focus is, is often improved by forest bathing. So research shows that children and adults, both those with and without attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADHD, uh, who spend time in nature have improved attention span, cog improved cognitive functioning, improved impulse control, uh, and that overall they found spending time in nature improves attention, memory, and focus. Uh, and a daily walk in nature was sacred to Albert Einstein. He believed that allowing his mind to wander during walks often helped him to uh, identify solutions to the universe's most vexing mysteries. Uh, a question that's come up is, do the benefits of forest bathing last for longer than the session itself? Uh, yes, definitely. They, they, all the evidence suggests that they have a uh, a, a, an effect quite a long time after the, the, the session itself and that people who uh, experience engage in forest bathing uh, sort of on a, on a weekly or bi-weekly basis tend to find uh, continual improvements. Uh, so forest bathing really is about mindfully using our senses. Uh, it's about hearing, sight, touch, taste uh, and smell, which are the, the five senses that we are most uh, accustomed to. Uh, however, we, we have certain other uh, senses. Uh, so one's called proprioception and one's called interoception and there are two additional senses or sensory inputs or data processing uh, that we possess that are fundamental to, to forest bathing. You don't need to remember these terms but it's, it's good if you, you kind of understand the concepts. So proprioception is defined as the neurological ability of the body to sense movement and position. So for example if you close your eyes and move your arms in the air uh, you, you, most people have the ability to sense its location. So even with their eyes closed, they know where their hands are, they know where their arms are, they know where their legs are. So you're able to feel your arm's location in space. 
and it's sometimes called your kinesthetic sense. And interoception is, is defined as sensitivity to stimuli originating inside the body. So, for example, uh, this sense is activated when you feel hungry uh, or sick, uh, but also the feelings that mindful consideration and focusing on things can encourage. Uh, so that they are senses that, that people may not necessarily uh, recognise being activated. Uh, but if they, they focus on them and look for them whilst forest bathing, they can quite often uh, learn to appreciate them. So uh, conversely, the five main senses are usually classified as extraception, uh, where you're receiving information externally. Uh, one of the, the questions that's uh, come up was about uh, taking a, a camera into or art materials into the environment. Um, art materials, I think, certainly. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about cameras later because generally it's considered best practice that you don't take technology with you uh, and, and focus on its use. But as I've said, there aren't any rules and you know whatever works well for you. And I actually find that uh, taking a camera with me can be very, very beneficial and, and can have a, a really uh, good effect on the experience. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, a little later. Somebody else has asked the question if there's evidence to suggest that forest bathing is beneficial with autistic clients. And there is a, a good amount of uh, evidence to, to suggest that uh, that it is beneficial, and I will attempt to uh, dig out the research that I, I, I've read on this and send it to you all. So moving on really to, to invitations, which are the, 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 the key uh, feature really of, of forest bathing. Uh, so Shinrin-yoku involves a sequence of invitations from the forest and a key part of practicing Shinrin-yoku is about honing your ability to identify and choose from an ever-changing kaleidoscope of, of invitations. So whilst there are some key invitations that are usually practiced on every forest bathing uh, outing, they shouldn't generally be viewed as exercises or assignments that need to be accomplished. So there are a few that are, are, are almost always used, but beyond that, it's about uh, trying to sort of turn up the volume on your senses and be open to noticing things. Uh, so it, it, it's potentially a bit like a, a, an improvised dance routine uh, so with the, with the forest as your, your dance partner. And there's a suggestion that when trying invitations, trying to uh, take a, a child, childlike curiosity approach is the, 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 the best thing to try. Um, what we tend to find is, is that uh, young children are very curious, they're very open to, to new experiences, uh, they look around them for, for new things, and they take in much more inf information. Whereas as we get older, uh, we tend to do this much less. So forest bathing invitations are activities that encourage you to consciously engage with the natural environment around you. Uh, they're designed to heighten your sensory awareness, what you will usually find is if you are being guided through your forest bathing activity, that the guide will periodically stop to offer invitations. However, if there's not a guide close at hand, uh, you can allow yourself to be guided by invitations just by being open to interesting sights and sounds, textures, patterns, smells, tastes. So it's just about being open to new sensory experiences. Uh, 
as I said, there aren't necessarily set invitations that, that people do, uh, but it sometimes works well to concentrate on one sense at a time and go through all your senses. So once you've gone a little way into the wood or forest, uh, a common first forest bathing experience is called the pleasures of presence. And you just stop, close your eyes, and you focus on each of your senses in turn. It's quite surprising quite often what you notice when you uh, close your eyes. Uh, we take in a, a lot of information through our eyes uh, and also if you close your eyes you tend to stand still which uh, allows you to concentrate, it allows you to focus more on your other senses and you quite often find that if you're walking through a wood or a forest that the wildlife around you uh, takes note of this and may well uh, move away or may stay very still whereas when you stop for a period of time uh, you quite often find that, that nature will start moving and will start making noises again. So usually with the presence of pleasures of presence you start by engaging your auditory sense and you listen to what you can hear around you. So uh, you think about whether you can hear animals, can you hear birds, can you hear the wind rustling the leaves. Uh, perhaps as an ex exercise take a, a deep breath in through your nose. Uh, so you know what can you smell, have a think about what you can feel. You can start at, at ground level and, and work upwards. So is the surface that you're standing on hard or soft? Is there a breeze that you can feel? If you've got more hair than I have, can you feel it blowing your hair or, or can you feel it blowing on your head? Can you feel which way the sun is orientated in relation to you? So could you sense where the sun is? Uh, if you then try turning through 90 degrees, either left or right, uh, and concentrate on what you can, does what you can hear change? If the sun is shining, how does it feel now that you've turned? Uh, does does the, 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 the light that you can see through your eyelids change as you, you turn around? And you continue turning in the same direction uh, until you're facing in the direction that you started. Uh, and at this point, uh, it's common to open your eyes and just focus for a while on the first thing that grabs your attention. So it's sometimes called a, a what's in motion invitation. Uh, so you, you focus on uh, either the first moving thing that you see or things that, uh, that, that move. Uh, and you, you can do this. Uh, standing, you can do it sitting, uh, or you can do it spontaneously as, a, as a, an invitation as you're, you're walking slowly along. One of the really important things is that if you can hear birdsong, for example, it, it's not about whether or not you can identify what kind of a, a bird it is, or if you uh, uh, are looking at a tree, being able to identify what, what kind of tree it is. It's just about appreciating its existence and it, its beauty rather than uh, necessarily being able to identify what they are. Really to get the most out of forest bathing, it, it's good to try your best to start by leaving your worries at the start of the walk. Now, some people use visualization techniques, so they visualize themselves placing their worries on a rock or a tree stump near the entrance uh, to the woodland. Uh, and kind of going back to technology, it's a good practice if you can resist the urge to tell yourself that you'll only use your mobile phone for taking pictures, try and turn it off and put it away or leave it in the car or at home whilst maintaining safety considerations. But generally when you're uh, forest bathing, you're not, you're not going uh, far from the path. Another thing about forest bathing is that some aspects of it may push you a little outside your comfort zone. So some people feel fine actually hugging a tree or talking to a tree. 
Uh, and it, it's important really to, to find your own balance between different practices. There may well be forest bathing practices that really resonate with you. There may be some that you think are uh, slightly strange, but uh, it's worth giving it a try. See if it works for you. If it works, try it again. If it doesn't, uh, don't. It's just worth pushing your boundaries a little bit to experience the effects uh, of activities that you've never tried before uh, and the effect that they can have on you. So where people go forest bathing in a, a group, it's uh, conventional uh, to periodically stop and share what you notice with each other. And this is sometimes referred to as council. Uh, and it, it could, this can be done in a, a variety of ways, but a common way it's done is if you've enough people to stand in a circle, you stand in a circle and pass either a stick or a stone that you found around. Uh, and the person with the stick is the one who speaks and uh, generally the others will listen without interruption. And it's usual that the person, when they start sharing, uh, uses the prompt, I am noticing. And once you've finished describing or sharing what it is that you, you've noticed or that you've seen, you pass the stick or stone to the next person. Uh, and this carries on until everybody has uh, commented and shared the things that they've, they've seen. And it's usual for people not to comment on what other uh, people in the group have, have said. Uh, just accept them and uh, take them in. Receive them with an open heart and an open mind uh, and try and avoid analysing or being judgmental. If it resonates with you and you're forest bathing alone, you can share what you're noticing with the forest. So you can talk to the trees, you can say to a plant, uh, you know, I am noticing the delicate spider's web that goes between your uh, stem and the stem next to you. You can also journal your thoughts, uh, which can which work for some people, other people find it time consuming. Uh, one of the things about saying things aloud rather than just saying them internally is that they tend to log them into your, your memory much better. So in the same way that when people are learning lines, uh, actors are, are learning their lines, they'll tend to say them aloud because it tends to, to log them in your, your memory much better. Equally, if uh, stopping and drawing is your thing, then really feel free to do it. So we're going to look at the, the main part of the, the uh, forest bathing approach, really, which is looking at different invitations. And invitations can be divided into the senses that, I, that they appeal to, uh, but quite often they're divided into the four elements of earth, air, fire and water instead. And the idea is that earth in invitations can help to foster your connection to the physical world. Uh, so earth, dirt, soil uh, should really be considered to be vibrant and, and full of life, much more than it should be something to be avoided. Uh, you'll also find that, uh, you know, particularly in woods and forests, Earth and soil can be quite aromatic. Uh, it can vary quite a lot in texture. Uh, you can try passing dirt from one hand to the other, uh, and you might find that some soil is quite light, some of it is heavier. Uh, you may get a feeling of holding some of the building blocks of nature. Um, it, again, it's an exercise that, that you can do by yourself passing earth from, from hand to hand and just feeling it, or you can uh, pass it to, to others in a, in a sharing circle. What you tend to find is, is that there's a particular quality of soil uh, and earth in, in woods and forests. So the forest floor tends to be a rich mix of decomposting leaves, grasses, fungi. Uh, it tends to have a, a much more uh, interesting texture than you know, regular dirt or, or, or garden soil. 
it, it may be much more likely to contain small creatures and insects. Uh, so the most basic earth invitation really is to pick up a handful of earth and you know, maybe rub it between your fingers, uh, use your sense of sight. So what does it look like? You might want to smell it. You might want to feel the texture. Uh, once you've done those, if it's something you feel comfortable doing and there's no obvious reason not to do it, uh, you might want to taste some of the traces of dirt that are, are left on your fingers. Um, certainly where it, it's healthy dirt and not polluted, there's research that suggests that uh, exposure to, to, to small amounts of soil and earth can, can uh, improve people's immune system and make them more resistant to disease rather than less so. So this kind of earth invitation uh, appeals to sight, to smell, to touch, and possibly even to taste. One of the most obvious uh, earth invitations that you can engage in is walking barefoot. Uh, so it will certainly depend on uh, you know, where you are, what kind of surface you're walking on, potentially even the, the, the temperature. This is much more of a a summer activity than, than maybe a, a winter activity, if it, particularly if it's snowing. But the soles of the feet are filled with uh, nerves that uh, can help to stimulate the entire body. Uh, there are many uh, natural health advocates who suggest that you should walk barefoot for at least half an hour every day. And Sort of recently and, and historically, there's, there's been a, a, a concept called earthing, uh, where people have uh, developed the idea that shoes can insulate us from ground flowing electrical currents uh, that we should be exposed to and that are very important for our, our well-being. So sometimes referred to as grounding, it's essentially the, the practice of uh, having bare skin in contact with the ground, and again, is believed to improve uh, the immune function. So if the weather's good, you can try walking for part of your forest bathing experience, uh, yeah, ideally somewhere that's uh, comparatively smooth and sandy and, and soft, uh, and there's, there's nothing really to say uh, you know, how long will you walk barefoot for and, and when you choose to put your shoes back on. But this is an invitation that's predominantly associated with the uh, sense of touch. Another invitation that, that I really enjoy is called Forest Floor, uh, which is where you explore a section of the forest floor, generally whilst positioned on your hands and knees. Uh, some people find taking a magnifying glass with them is useful. Uh, part of the, the idea of this invitation is, is that you're forced to stop and stay still. Uh, you're, you're forced to avoid rushing because when we, we, when, we, when we make sort of sharp movements, we tend to find that, that insects hide uh, or certainly that they don't land on the, the plant life near us. Whereas if we stay still, uh, we'll often find that the insects that we haven't noticed will start uh, start moving again, will start landing on the, the, the plants around us. So you know, whilst I, I suggested it, it's, uh, it's a good idea to avoid taking technology with you uh, on forest bathing experiences, I get really into what I call mindful macro photography. Um, where I try and look for things that I wouldn't normally see and photographs. And so, so this is an example of, of a photograph that I took. Uh, and I think this bug was probably maybe two or three millimeters long in its body. So uh, it's, it's, it really was looking up close. And so forest floor is an invitation associated uh, mainly with sight but uh, you know, it can be about touch, it can be about smell. So it's not necessarily just about looking for insects. It can be about looking 
uh, very closely at a flower and you know looking at the, the pollen or the, or the stamen uh, within the, the flower or the patterns of the flower. Um, one of the things that I'm, I'm particularly interested in is bees and bees tend to see in a, a slightly different way to the way that we do. They, they can see a bit more ultraviolet uh, and quite often the plants that appeal to bees when looked at uh, either under ultraviolet light or, or using ultraviolet photography have a, a bullseye effect that channels the bees into where the pollen and the, and the nectar is. But quite often if, if you look uh, you can just about see these these patterns on the on the flowers. Uh, so another earth invitation is called holding the holding the stone. So what we'll tend to find is that uh, the stones that we find will have been shaped and reshaped by nature over a, an exceptionally long length of time. Uh, so some will have uh, come from uh, you know, volcanic sources, so they'll have been created in, in fire. Others uh, may have been buried for a long time. Others may well have been shaped by wind or by uh, water. And they're all really fairly unique. Uh, but the, the best thing to do if doing a stone invitation is to try and find an area that has a, 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 good, a good range of stones. So lots of different ones in different vary, varying sizes. So you know, really look, look a bit up and down the, the edge of a stream. Try and find a stone that particularly uh, beckons to you, that calls out to you. Uh, and usually with this invitation, once you've found the stone, just before you pick it up, have a look round, you know, see where it is, uh, then hold it uh, and explore it visually. So you, you can turn it over, you can look at it, uh, you know, the, the, the texture that you can see. Uh, if you want, you can then close your eyes and continue to explore the zone using your sense of touch. So you know, just think about you know, what makes the stone unique. Try and take a moment to imagine what the stone's been through, how has it been formed. So if it is on the edge of a stream, you know, how long has it been a part of the stream? Has it been washed gently down from the mountains? You know, what kind of a journey has it had? Has it spent some of its time buried in the earth? Uh, you know, it, it, it may at some point have been subjected to massive amounts of, of pressure and then released. So the invitation is about thinking about stones and you know, how they're formed, what they've been through, and really the, 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 the length of time that they've been uh, part of the landscape and the length of time they'll probably be part of the landscape you know, long after we're gone. So this is an invitation most associated really with sight and touch. So moving on, the next section that we're going to talk about is air invitations. So air invitations include anything uh, that involves breathing, smelling, uh, taking note of uh, motions caused by movements in, in air. So there are, there are numerous air invitations, uh, but we'll look at a couple here. So one is called forest breathing. Breathing is uh, essential uh, to our existence, but much of the time we often don't breathe in a way that's considered correctly. Um, it, it's one of the reasons why many uh, activities such as yoga or often martial arts or meditation focuses on breathing. What we often do is that we breathe quite shallowly, meaning that, that our blood isn't as, as oxygenated as it could be. Uh, and so this encourages you to, to slow down your breathing and to take deep breaths. And it's believed that the benefits of deep breathing 
are magnified and amplified whilst in the forest uh, because the air tends to be fresher and the oxygen tends to be cleaner. Um, trees we know uh, act as really the, 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 the uh, scrubbers of the, of the air. And you can also find that certain parts of, of forests, particularly if you're near a waterfall, um, you, you can get you know, differently charged air. So uh, waterfalls tend to create a lot of negative ions uh, near them. So it's a very simple invitation, which usually involves inhaling slowly for about eight seconds, whilst fully expanding your diaphragm, so pushing your, your stomach out, taking a, a very deep breath, holding it for about five seconds, and then slowly breathing out again for about 10 seconds. And it's generally considered uh, a good practice to do it at least sort of five or six times. I think possibly one of my favorite uh, invitations is uh, one that's sometimes referred to as scratch and sniff. It works very well with trees such as pine trees. Uh, and in fact, pine trees bring a, 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 a myriad benefits. So the next time you're standing near a pine tree, uh, grab a pine needle either off the tree or from the floor uh, and scratch it with a fingernail and then sniff it deeply. Uh, and pine needles release uh, scents for, from the essential oils contained in them. And you can do it as well with other materials. Bark. Uh, will often have a, 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 a different smell if you if you sniff it. Wildflowers obviously have a have a scent to them. Uh, I said I particularly liked pine trees. Uh, pine cones can offer so many different invitations. Uh, you know you can hold them in your hand, you can turn them over, so you can look at them, you can touch them, you can smell them. That they're, they're a very tactile thing to just focus on for, for five or ten minutes. Going back to this childhood uh, curiosity thing. Uh, so watching clouds is an invitation uh, that may take you back to childhood. So as children, uh, many of us enjoyed watching clouds uh, as they morphed into different shapes, spotting what kind of things that you could see in, in the clouds. And as adults, we very rarely take the time to enjoy this experience. Uh, but a forest walk is a, is a brilliant time to do this so you know weather permitting if it's not raining and there are there isn't solid cloud cover try and find a good spot to lay down uh, and just spend 10 to 20 minutes gazing at the clouds uh, and looking for shapes another air invitation is called swaying it, it's a good invitation to do where you're uh, in, a, in a more densely wooded part of the forest and particularly where there's a steady breeze blowing. Uh, so it, it's about standing a distance away from the tree, looking at the base of the tree and then looking up from the base of the tree to the top of the tree uh, and thinking about how the breeze might be different uh, down on the ground to up, uh, up in the top of the trees. So there may be little breeze at ground level, partly because you're sheltered by the trees or partly just because of the height. But does there appear to be more of a breeze up at the top of the tree? Have a look around and see if, if any particular trees are calling you. Uh, and then part of the, 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 the swaying invitation is, is to face the tree and feel as if you're allowing yourself to take root in the ground uh, whilst your the rest of your body remains flexible uh, and you you kind of sway with the tree uh, be more tree so it's a bit like dancing with a gently moving tree and you can think about how the movement feels uh, both within your body and outside of it so do you feel the move the, the wind move around you as you sway how does it feel to move with the tree uh, you know do you feel that there's a relationship between the wind and various parts of your body do you feel the wind most anywhere do you feel the experience most 
anywhere. And you can change the, 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 the way in which you sway and see if it alters the, the, the way that you feel the wind flowing round you, flowing past you. Do you feel at one with the wind? Do you feel at one with the tree? So it's just about sort of movement in harmony with, with nature and thinking about how this movement and this idea of, of, of harmony affects you. So it's, it's just about thinking, thinking on the, the experience. So moving on through the elements, fire invitations. So fire is a symbol of energy, of the energy of relationships. Uh, and we're going to look at some invitations which both ignite and tend this fire uh, of, of relationships with the natural world. So we're not talking about actually working with fire. It's not about uh, uh, disposable barbecues or, or anything. And so the first invitation is called Speak Aloud, which is an invitation uh, allowing you to both give and to receive. And practicing giving and receiving together opens you up to levels of communication that you may not uh, necessarily have, have experienced before. Uh, and you're trying to build this feeling of oneness with the, the, the trees around you. So the first part of the invitation uh, allows you to receive the sights and the sounds and the sensations that the forest offers. So it, it's looking at the way the forest might be communicating with you uh, and might be communicating with other beings in the forest. So part of it's about imagining that what you can hear and what you can see all has uh, a purpose and a, and a meaning. So we might feel that the rustling of leaves is just a result of the wind uh, and is therefore meaningless. However, if, if we think about the relationship between the wind and the, the impact that it has on, on the tree, imagine that the, the, the sounds that you hear are uh, representative of uh, your, what the forest is saying uh, and that you're a, a part of it. So the second part of the invitation is about uh, speaking aloud back to the forest. This is one of the, the, the times where this will be something which you know resonates with some people and makes other people feel awkward or silly. Um, it, it's it's definitely worth trying just to to see if you experience something that you hadn't necessarily expected to. So feeling free to say hello to the stones, uh, greet the water in the stream or the, the willows as you pass them uh, and as, as they sway. So your movements, uh, your gestures are also a way of speaking to the, 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 the forest. Hopefully, if you try it, uh, you'll feel less silly uh, and ideally sort of more empowered uh, and more in tune with what's around you. Uh, some people find that speaking to trees has a, a, a big impact on them. Uh, historically and spiritually, trees have been considered to be very patient listeners, uh, they're non-judgmental uh, and good at keeping secrets. So uh, the forest bathing speak to a tree invitation invites you to either give a quick hello as you pass or sit by a tree either facing it or leaning against it and having a longer conversation or you can say nothing at all uh, you can just sit and uh, and be one with the tree introduce yourself get to know each other uh, but it's about feeling attuned with the tree uh, and this invitation is associated with a, a slightly different kind of sense uh, that's sometimes called imaginal sensing uh, and it, it's about listening with your whole imagination uh, allowing the presence of the tree and everything that's happening around you and inside you uh, to make an impression on your thoughts and emotions and sensations. So it's about thinking, uh, you know, about how you feel when you're 
in the woods or the forest? What kind of sensations does being in that environment uh, bring out with you? Uh, and and you know, questioning whether some of your emotional responses are necessarily just coming from within you or, 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 or the degree to which you know, what's going on around you is influencing you. So the, the voice of a tree uh, can take many forms. It might be a daydream. It might be an urge to move in synchronization with the tree. Uh, then you, you might have a memory that comes from nowhere or even a wave of emotion. You might feel uh, ecstatically happy, slightly sad. Uh, so when speaking to a tree, it, it, it's expressions of its voice should be considered to be things like the way it moves, the shape, uh, you know, the events that have uh, made it as it is. So, uh, you know, resilience is often described as, uh, you know, overcoming, uh, overcoming, uh, stress and things so if you think about trees where where the trees that are around the edge of the forest will often have deeper roots because the wind has blown them and as they've built resilience uh, they, they've built uh, a stronger root pattern so imaginal sensing is about using your imagination to receive the tree's message uh, when you're uh, around them and forest bathing One of the really important aspects of forest bathing is uh, appreciating reciprocity. So appreciating the, uh, the, 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 the link that humans and trees have. So when you're next outside, whether it's in a city and you're under a single big tree, or you might be in a small wood, or you might be in a huge forest, Stop and think for a moment about the relationship that we have with trees. So the leaves of the trees uh, use sunlight and they use water and they use carbon dioxide that they absorb to make plant sugars. And at the same time, they release oxygen. Uh, so we breathe in oxygen, amongst other things, and this is necessary for our lives. And we breathe out carbon dioxide uh, that the trees need to live. And so thinking about this cycle uh, of, of reciprocity and reciprocal breathing is all part of the, the overall forest bathing concept. One of the other really important things about forest bathing is that it, it really opposes the idea that, that, that natural resources or natural capital that we have are simply a collection of, of resources. Uh, one of the important aspects of forest bathing is the, the idea that you should give as much as you receive. So this is the process of, of reciprocity. Uh, and the idea is that we don't exploit uh, forests, uh, that, that everything we do is consistent with the, the aims of forest bathing, in which the gifts that are offered are respected, uh, but that you not only take, but you receive. And this disjoint is often seen uh, amongst, sort of, they might be described as green, green sports people, uh, that there's a significant amount of activity that occurs in nature uh, that can be very uh, damaging rather than being beneficial. Uh, one of the things that's very often highlighted is ski resorts. Ski resorts tend to have massive carbon footprints uh, and the bigger the carbon footprint of something, the more it contributes to global warming. But of course, ski resorts are one of the things that will, uh, you know, fail first in the event of, of an increase in global temperatures. So it's, it's kind of about thinking about the, the, the relationship between activities which go on in nature and, you know, the, the effect that they have. This is, this is what, uh, you know, the, the, the reciprocal idea of, of giving as much as you, you, you take. Uh, 
the idea of res reciprocity is also about increasing awareness of the ways in which we're connected to the the, the natural world thinking about uh you know how much we need nature how much we we need uh trees and things to uh to live you know rather than necessarily exploiting them so part of this idea is you know stopping taking note of what's around you uh acknowledging uh what's around you thinking about what you get from it uh you know thinking of the, the multiple uses that that trees have so they they provide shade uh you may be able to sit on a lower branch uh they the root systems tend to reduce soil erosion uh so if you feel comfortable with it offer something to the tree it might be uh a song there's a there's a long history of wassailing and singing to trees particularly fruit bearing trees or a kind gesture or just sitting uh you know waiting for inspiration to to to, to come and it's encouraged that you you do this every time you you forest bathe so focusing on you know the reciprocal relationship that we have water invitations uh in many ways i, I think again some of my, my favorite invitations so what is an essential part of life again it's a very important part of forest bathing uh, it, it's suggested that an ideal forest bathing uh, experience should involve interaction with water wherever possible. Um, so you know, if you can choose uh, a, a path to go on forest bathing that allows you easy access to, to running water, it adds to the experience but you know try and avoid not putting yourself in danger so uh avoid going down s steep banks uh through brambles uh don't get stung by nettles don't slide down loose rocks and things usually or hopefully you can find uh you know part of a pond or a lake or a loch or a river that's easily accessible and safe the best option, if you can find it, is a is a, a, a running stream that's clean and fresh. Uh, and you know, if you feel confident, you can uh, drink from it. One of the things about running water is that it, it provides sound that you might not necessarily get uh, in in still water. Though you know, if you sit and, and on a rock and think about it you know you often get a, a lapping sound if you're on the edge of a, a loch but the soundscape of streams can be re really quite relaxing so we'll look at a, a couple of, of water invitations so the simplest is probably uh, sitting by water it just requires you to sit in a, a fairly dreamlike meditative state um, where you sit somewhere comfortable, settle for a while, 10, 15, 20 minutes, uh, and, and, and again, go through the effect that the, the water's having on your senses. So are there things on the surface of the water that you can see? Is the water carrying things past you? What's beneath the surface? You know, are, are there fish that you can see? Can you see uh, patterns that the, 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 the water makes? Anyone who's been a, a, a whitewater canoeist will know that upstream Vs are often caused by uh, rocks under the water. So, uh, you know, you, you can think about uh, how what's under the water is influencing the water. You can concentrate on the sound of the water. Does the air smell different near the water? Um, certainly after a storm, we, we tend to smell things differently, but quite often that there is a different smell or a different quality to the air near water. And so sitting by water can be associated with hearing and listening, uh, sight, uh, with smell, uh, and also with sort of imaginal sensing. You, you can think about where the water started, where it's going to, 
you might think for a while on the, the water cycle of water uh, evaporating and falling as precipitation um, and then continuing the cycle. One of my favourites has always been feet in the stream. Uh, it is, as it says really, you take your shoes off and place your feet in the water. Uh, if it's a hot day, it can be a, a lovely feeling. And you can either sit with your feet in the water and feel how the, the water moves around you. <laughs> you can, if it's shallow enough and safe enough, you can walk in the shallower part of the, the stream. Uh, potentially if it's rocky or uh, the water's faster moving. A stick will make you more like a tripod and less likely to, to fall over. Uh, and you can practice this invitation really for as long as you, you feel. Uh, I wouldn't suggest going for, for long after your feet get cold. Uh, but moving around the stream can give you sensations of how the water flow is, is changing. Another invitation which is uh, very commonly ex part of a, a forest bathing experience is what's called sit spot. And it's usually used towards the end of a forest bathing walk. And really it's just as it sounds. The idea is that you sit down for 15 or 20 minutes uh, and do nothing. So just sitting is something which we rarely do, but it, it can, often provide a profound bonding with nature. One of the things that people quite often find if they're walking or hiking is that they're thinking quite a lot about where they're putting their feet, much more than they're taking in their, their environment. Whereas if you just sit and look around, um, take in the things that you see, look for things that you wouldn't necessarily find, you know, you can look from the distance to the to, to what's just in front of you. So there's no real agenda, no expectation. Uh, it's just about sitting. Uh, and really, you can do it anywhere. It doesn't have to be in a forest. Uh, you can do it by a window. You can do it with a pot plant for, for company. But it's really just about taking time out, sitting and looking around you. Another common invitation is called achieving nothing. Uh, so uh, part of a uh, forest bathing experience can be just allowing yourself to let go of any plans or any achievements or any goals or any intentions that you have in mind. Uh, it's just about not, not attempting to do anything. Uh, really, and, and, and taking then taking note of of how you feel. It, it's it's very much a mindful activity, which is uh, about really being in the present, um, being in the moment. So it's it's trying not to concern yourself with what's happened before the forest bathing experience or anything that you need to do afterwards. Uh, so it's just about sitting quietly trying to avoid thinking about your to-do list, trying to avoid thinking about issues related to daily life. Uh, this isn't necessarily that you try and exclude these things. If they do intrude into your thoughts, just identify them and let them go. It's just about not dwelling on them uh, and not ruminating on things. And also sitting, the beauty of sitting quietly is that you'll often be surprised by the number of, of uh, creatures and animals that you, you see using this process. So it may be that uh, you just don't notice some of them, and they're always there, or that by sitting very quietly, the animals have become much more accustomed to your presence, uh, and this connection just happens. So really that's the, the, the end of the different uh, invitations. As I said, one of the uh, common themes within forest bathing and quite possibly because it's got its roots in Shinrin-yoku and, and Japan is having a snack and a, and a cup of tea at the end. So if it's something you're proficient in and confident about, uh, you know, you can pick berries to eat, you can uh, pick leaves that you can either eat or, or make a drink from. If it's something that you're not 100% sure about, uh, 
you know, take supplies with you rather than risking eating or drinking something that might have a detrimental effect on you. Um, but if it's something that, you, that you're going to do regularly and you enjoy, uh, Kelly kettles or uh, volcano kettles, as they're called, are really, really useful. Uh, it's, a, it's a hollow kettle and you build a small fire in the, uh, in the, the, the container at the bottom and the, the kettle acts like a chimney. And I've seen people have a, have a race between uh, an electric kettle and a Kelly kettle. And they, they burn, particularly dry wood, very, very quickly. Uh, and they, they, they'll, they make a, a good brew and very, very fast. It brings us on to the end of, of the walk. As I said at the beginning, the idea is that uh, you, you try your best to leave uh, your, your worries and your baggage uh, at, the, at the, the, the gates to the forest as you go in. Uh, and if you feel that you need to pick it up on, on the way back, look at where you left your, your, your mental baggage. Uh, and hopefully uh, you'll have found that by engaging uh, in forest bathing, by uh, participating in, in sort of nature-based mindful activities, the, the, the issues will become smaller while you're away. And it's also a common practice to, to look back at where you've come from uh, and try and identify or notice three things that you've experienced uh, that have made you feel good. I said that uh, I'd, I'd give you information about uh, forest therapy guides. There's a, an organization called the Forest Therapy Institute, which is uh, a predominantly European organization of forest guides and forest therapists. This is the uh, web address. I will uh, include it in some handouts that I, I send later or tomorrow. Uh, but that's it really. Does anyone have any questions that they would like to ask? Uh, I can, if you want, wish to unmute yourself and ask them verbally, please feel free uh, or feel free to type them. Really interesting question. Would you encourage bringing a pet? There, there, is, there are books uh, about uh, taking your dog on, a, on forest therapy experiences. I think it probably depends very much on the animal that you, you have. Uh, I have two dogs and one of them's uh, kind of good uh, for taking on, on forest bathing experiences. On the whole, he tends to go and do his own thing. Uh, and you, you can sit quite quietly and then he'll come back and join you quite quietly. What I've tended to find though is that he can sense when I spot something that I'm really, really interested in, uh, like a checkered skippered butterfly in the local woods, uh, and then comes thundering through and uh, no more, no more lovely butterfly uh, but yes it, it, it's you know if you find that in, interacting with your pet makes it uh, a beneficial experience then absolutely do it. It, it it really shouldn't be something with with rules uh, somebody's asked if they can see the website again I'll, I'll click back to that and you can uh, write it down <clears throat> the usual group sizes of, of, of sessions are, are, Usually sort of four to six people is, is a normal session size. Um, when I've uh, done this kind of thing with the uh, High Life Highland Rangers, it, it's tended to be just the number of people who turn up, which is usually sort of uh, between four and eight. Um, so it, it's big enough that you can you know, share experiences if, if that's part of your experience, but equally small enough that uh, that you don't distract each other and that you, you can share. So would the sharing circle occur before the tea ceremony or during? Usually before 
uh, you know, and I think the tea ceremony is a time to, to sit and, and socialise a bit more. The thing with forest bathing is, is it's about getting a balance between uh, you know, sociability and impacting on other people. So if other people are trying to concentrate on sounds and, and you're having a, a general chit chat with uh, someone else, it could uh, it could put them off. Uh, somebody else has asked, how often do I get to bathe in the forest myself? And I think the answer is probably definitely not as often uh, as I would like. Um, as I say, I, I live and work on a croft, which at the moment is is taking up an enormous amount of my time, and I get out far less frequently than I should, or would like to, or would be beneficial. Uh, and I am a very great believer in the Zen Buddhist suggestion that you should spend 20 minutes a day uh, in mindfulness or meditation, and that if 20 minutes is too long for you and you haven't got the time then you should be spending an hour a day on it so uh it, it, it's but it, it doesn't necessarily need to be really something that, that that's planned one of the I, I i talk quite a lot about mindfulness in other things that i do and when i was first introduced to mindfulness you know, it was about a, a longish experience, 15 to 20 minutes of sitting and breathing, uh, which works for some people and it doesn't work for others. Um, I've found that a minute or two of mindfulness can have a, a, a great effect. So you don't necessarily have to make each forest bathing experience uh you know, a big activity. It can just be about stopping for five minutes and just looking at a tree, stopping on your way home, walking through the park and just looking around, you know, maybe slowly turning 360 degrees and just noting the things that you walk past every day and don't notice. Uh, one of the things that concerns me, I think, is I've, I've lived in the Highlands of Scotland for three years, and I think I'm beginning to become a little more complacent about the beauty of, of, of where I live. And I certainly notice that people who've lived here all their lives don't notice just how, how, how lovely it is. Um, do I have any specific locations to share? Is it a trade secret? It's not a secret at all, really anywhere that you can, uh, that you can go. But as, as I say, I'm very fortunate to live within walking distance of, of the Ariundel Oak Woods. Uh, and the Ariundel Oak Woods are uh, a remnant of the old Atlantic Oak Woods. So there, there was a, an oak wood that ran down the, the west coast of Norway, uh, and then the west coast of Scotland, uh, through Scotland, through Wales, uh, and down through Spain and Portugal. And there are only very little bits of it left. But uh, I'm, I'm not entirely sure that when I, I moved and it was described as a rainforest that I was full of glee, because um, it does rain quite a lot there. However, one of the things that, that you, you, you really notice in this forest is the lichen on the trees. Um, so lichen tends to only grow on trees uh, that are uh, in, in areas of low air pollution. So it, oh, I can't remember the, the, the exact kind, but it's like sort of old man's beard. It's green and stringy. I'll find the, the, the name of it uh, and send it on. But yeah, certainly look, look, look for places with lichen on the trees. Uh, how am I spelling it? It's A-R-I-U-N-D-L-E. Um, and if you're trying to find it on a map, um, if you Google Derek Social Croft uh, and go ever so slightly southeast from us, you'll find it. But it, it's, it's very, very close. Um, that's really it for this evening. I've got... 
uh, I'm, I'm quite happy to, to carry on having chats with people uh, via email or over Facebook. And yeah, so you know, go out, have a try, see what you think, do the thing, do the bits that you like, don't do the bits that you don't like, uh, and hopefully it will increase your well-being and reduce your stress and anxiety. You're welcome. I hope you have a enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you very, very much. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.